Hello. So today I am going to be breaking down a gate analysis from my uh, talk at Parker University down in Dallas, Texas last weekend for the rehab to performance group. And uh, we we're uh, lucky enough to have an hour before I spoke at the symposium that weekend with uh, some students from Parker and Logan, a few other places, and one student volunteered to get his gate running gate broken down. So let's break this down. So let me share the screen. Okay. For anybody that's wondering, this is on form. I am not sponsored by them. If they want to sponsor me, that would be amazing. But let's get after it. So we went through this hierarchy of uh, what we should be looking at in terms of like the most important to the least important. Uh, we talked about the three phases of running, uh, all these great things, but let's just break this gate down pretty quick because that was the goal of this talk was to show you that it shouldn't be this complex algorithmic approach to gate. Uh, I think it's a lot of times we get too much data, we get lost in minutia, and then we don't know how to act upon what we actually see or garner from the analysis. So let's break this down and see if there's anything that we could work on because as I, uh, said to the students during that talk. Nine times out of 10, when it comes down to uh, end game skill based things, right? Running, throwing, jumping, whatever the skill is of the sport or the movement, rarely were you just creating an entry point there for change, right? So if it comes to a running issue, we would like go backwards, which we would have already done these things and make sure that we're like checking out like, well, hey, maybe they're overstriding because they have a stiff ankle and that clears out ankle dorsiflexion, things like that. So those are all the things that we uh, sometimes don't just hop right in. People think that they get a gait analysis and they get gait coaching. Most of the time we're looking at how they run and we're using that as an objective measure for, hey, when we go change these other things, does your running change or not? If we've changed all of the precursory uh, things, issues, dysfunctions, whatever we wanna work on, and running still hasn't changed, that's when we would jump in and say, okay, maybe there's some coaching at the skill level um, that we'll start working on. And sometimes we do a little bit of both. So let's get going. So if we put our little, and yeah, I love how on this app it breaks down everybody. So let's zoom in here a little bit. So you can see everybody's got their 3D digital motion analysis going or 2D digital analysis. So we're going to zoom in on our runner's feet. And sorry, I'm looking off the left of the camera here. So the first thing we want to look at is that our first point of impact. So I would say the first time that we see foam compression is about there. So what we want to look at with this, if we draw an angle off of the treadmill, the best we can and realize that there's parallax occurring here and we bisect through the middle of the tibia and we get that kind of there, you know, that's a lot steeper of a negative shin angle. So a negative shin angle means the shin's pointing back, the runner positive would be forward positive. You're usually gonna see in somebody that's sprinting or running really uh, really quick over a long distance. A negative shin angle is going to equate to a lot more impact forces and the greatest impact forces on any runner are gonna be seen at kind of the same spot uh, that most people would complain of like medial shin splints. So it's the distal third or uh, uh, that distal portion of the uh, medial tibia is where we see a lot of uh, stress put through the body. And then other things can affect it like a crossover gait where we see bowing of the tibia, which can cause that kind of medial tibial stress syndrome. Uh, so what's the normal? The normal would be seven degrees or less. And we have, or seven degrees of variance in there. We would like to see it pretty perpendicular under the runner, but that, a lot of that determines is determined based on speed. Uh, body morphology, uh, all skill, all these things. So we can see with this guy, if we took 90 as neutral and we're drawing this off parallax, right? So I'm at his hip or looking down the treadmill, maybe incline a little bit, even though we zeroed it out, like it's not true, but it's as true as we can do for this gait analysis. So if it was 14 degrees, 90 being neutral, that's way too much. The other thing that's going on here, if we clear this out is we can see that he is on a relatively, almost fully extended knee. Now for your world-class runners, you could have upwards of 65 degrees of knee flexion at impact. Um, and that's really a stance phase. So let's say impact about 35 to 40 degrees. 
that's a, a major impact reducer, but it's also metabolically costly because you have to use your quadriceps and hamstrings and glute or hip musculature to uh, essentially offload all the impact. He would rather use a little bit more bony approximation, which is one of our things that we talk about for a general grab bag gate analysis is like, what is their strategy? Are they using, you know, soft tissue energy return? Or are they using a lot of muscular concentric contraction? Are they using bony approximation for stability? Here we'd see a relatively extended leg um, with a large negative shin angle, which to me shows a lot of impact forces being driven straight back up into um, the central axis, which is not great for all sorts of things. So uh, again, seven degrees would be normal. So if we could take him forward in space, we may say, hey, this is something more ideal that we would like to see where we'd see that tibia become a little more perpendicular because this is one of the biggest predictors of injuries. That's why it's high on the list is the verticality of the lower shank or the tibia at first initial impact. Uh, so it, a lot of people got coached early in, you know, gait analysis, maybe five, 10 years ago that we want to look at what part of the foot was hitting. I think we all have gotten a little smarter that we know that uh, if you're running below a certain speed, so if I'm above like a seven minute pace around there, research would say 630 to 720, that heel striking is actually more advantageous. Um, the other thing is that uh, if I'm going to be a very forefoot runner, whether that's uh, contrived or natural, I'm at a higher risk for injuries below the knee. If I'm a heel striker, I'm at a higher risk of injuries above the knee. It's just kind of the, the phenotype of the runner at that point. So here we can see when he's at kind of mid stance phase, see that good flexion angle of the knee. This is where you'd like to see a little more of this impact because that offloads a lot of this, uh, the, the impact going up to the central axis. But we want to ask the questions, why wouldn't he want to do that? Maybe he doesn't have, you know, great hip strength. Maybe he doesn't have great central stability or coordination. We don't know until we test further or tested before. And then the gait analysis, either the, you know, icing on the cake evaluation at that point, if we zoom out, so if he's at mid stance, this is kind of where we're starting to transition to push off. This gives us a good idea of like general, um, I would say general strategy. And if we put this middle of the angle, if we put it through his ear, his hip and his knee, and again, these are approximations. So we see he's got a decent hip hinge going on here, right? He's sitting into his hips. This is something that you'll see in a lot of runners as they get more fatigued. Uh, if we see this straight off the bat, right? This is only 30 seconds into him running on a treadmill, I, I think eight miles per hour. Um, he's sitting into his hips. So this leads, this is another, like, I talk a lot about converging patterns or overlay of information. So we see he reaches out in front of himself on a uh, relatively extended knee. He sits into his hip. I'm already thinking high on my list is central stability or hip strength or both. And um, maybe not, you know, and then if we go into, hey, I'm gonna coach him to get his foot a little more under center of mass, sit up out of that hip and he can't, he's just gonna compensate elsewhere. So that's kind of the, <clears throat> the problems that you can run into by coaching people in any movement besides looking at the, the prerequisites and the foundations and the principles that should come before this. Um, other general strategies that we can see from here or from the side view, um, I'm gonna clear this out real quick. Uh, we want to look at peak hip um, extension. He does amazing here. So our elites are going to do like 40 degrees of hip extension. We'd say you have to have a 15 degree minimum hip extension. Um, he is well into that 40 degrees. We don't even need to draw it. Um, I wouldn't say it's the most posterior chain driven action because we can see as he kind of pulls off, look at his return angle. It's actually not that bad. So the return angle or the knee flexion angle um, at swing phase is what we're looking at now. So I'm going to draw another angle in here. I'm going to flip this around. So I'm going to go hip, knee, ankle, and we wouldn't see a minimum 90 degrees. Um, if you're looking at an elite runner, and again, this is, you know, varies based on speed and all those things, uh, upwards of 135 degrees. So he's above that 90 degrees, which is great. Um, so not too bad. What we kind of think there's two things that happen is we increase that knee flexion angle on swing phase. We can postulate that they're going to be using more posterior chain. Hamstring is the biggest lever for uh, sagittal plane forward motion when we're running. Uh, the glutes, not as much as we think. Uh, they help with uh, like a high uh, or a 
high gear push offs when we're sprinting, things like that, your glute becomes a little uh, better for that like high gear push off at the end. Think like pushing a sled, popping off the end of a, a sprint stroke. Uh, the other thing is, as we increase that knee flexion angle, we reduce the moment arm of that leg. So we know that a, a long lever, think a long pendulum, takes more energy and time to swing than a short lever. So we're thinking about leg turnover and cadence. The shorter that lever, the better off we're going to be from uh, a lot of things. Uh, energy expenditure, efficiency, knee drive, which is the next thing we'll look at is knee drive. So if we clear this back out and we drive up, this is where we start to see that's the most knee flexion he's going to have here. So I want you to appreciate that if we're going this way, oh, clear, clear. That's the most knee um, drive or hip flexion, knee drive he's going to get. And then from here, what's he do? He starts to kick out. So instead of driving his knee upwards and then letting his foot drop underneath of him like a plumb line, um, which is gonna give him more vertical oscillation or uh, the ability to use the ground to use things like the windless mechanism where we wind up the big toe of the plantar fashion the Achilles to pop off the ground. He's reaching out in front of himself, which gives him more time on the ground, which is another predictor of injury. Uh, but it also reduces his uh, passive tissue energy return, which is a huge deal for uh, uh, endurance athletes, which is we talked about if you were at the, the RTP club talk about phenotyping runners, the the more stretchy versus the stiff runner. And, um, you know, the best in the world are actually a little more stretchy. They just have great motor control. So they can get into these inner ranges, really wind these tissues up and let them go like slingshots. So that's the bulk of it from the side view. Yeah, we want to look at general postural things, which he does pretty good. But let's go ahead and flip over to um, the down the line view. Now, one thing you can tell right away, I'm off to the right. This is just based on gym equipment. I'm laying on, a, I think, a tread climber. Uh, getting super tactical with it now. So we're gonna put our 3D back on. So I'm off to the right. So the first thing that we would be looking at is like crossover at this point. So when we're at mid stance, and this is gonna be hard to dictate, but he actually does it pretty decent because the parallax and it should be off your sacrum going right down through the middle of your body. So we're gonna see the medial edge of the foot just lateral to our, our central axis, which he's actually doing really well. Um, it's going to be more skewed as I come over to the left as far as where I'm at with the camera because you're not going to be able to tell. But I can tell you he's, if you could think three-dimensionally, if we rotated him, he's actually doing pretty well here. Now, something else that gets called out here, and we can see this with the, um, the axes that on form puts on here. So as he comes in with his right hip, I'm going to actually let this play at a low speed here for a second. Oh. So some people would say, well, his right hip is dropping a little too much. I'm sorry if you can hear me speaking in tongues there in slow-mo. So actually, uh, sagittal plane hip rotation, right? The ability for your SI joints and your hip to oscillate on the sagittal plane upwards of five degrees is one of the biggest decreases of impact for a runner. So you actually want to see the hip drop subtly. We don't want to see it drop more than five degrees or rotate more than five degrees. So we see there's actually an asymmetry here. So we see that the left actually posts up and the right kind of drops down. So I hope you can appreciate that. That's actually what we want to see. So the big deal here, um, I'm going to turn the volume down here. On. So He doesn't get much T-spine rotation. Sorry, I got an emoji list up here. In particular, on the left. So right is better than left. So what you'll see, and this isn't talked about a whole lot, that um, nobody knows the normative values for thoracic spine rotation in runners. This is something I talk about a lot. I don't want to hound on it, but you need torso rotation to create torque to then just send you in the sagittal plane. That's our version of a drive train um, or drive shaft using a differential in a car. Uh, a lot of people get rotation coached out of them, right? They t get told not to cross over. There are any elite runners crossing over the midline with their arms. It's just we don't want anything to go too far. Um, we see an asymmetry, one of the biggest predictors of injury. So we see tibia verticality. Um, we see uh, decreased uh, inability to handle impact forces to be up there. And then actually asymmetries is like way up on that list. 
Uh, so if we see asymmetrical differences in rotation, hip rotation, we're thinking, you know, I don't know how these things move because we just did a gait analysis. So let's say his T-spine doesn't rotate well to the left or his right hip doesn't rotate well. Okay, that's the first thing you work on. Second, if it does, then maybe it's, you know, strategy or strength. Well, then that's what we work on. And if all those things work, now we can start coaching stuff up. But I would almost guarantee you that you're going to like hit something as you go through your exam and normal treatment or rehab. It can get very frustrating for runners out there watching a YouTube video like this or working with a coach or somebody that's given the gait analysis in particular online. Because I will tell you right now, a gait analysis is not aimed at improving your performance unless you are like completely out of the injury realm which we tell people all the time, a gait analysis is not for an injury, it's for performance enhancement. Um, and it's an objective outcome. I can kind of explain this in, uh, if you're a doc or a, you know, a Cairo PT, whatever, and you're having somebody touch their toes, we don't necessarily think like touching your toes is performance based, maybe an outcome measure of like, hey, is that painful? Does it look better? But then it does become performance and based if you're going to pick something up, you're going to deadlift, but we wouldn't just start coaching the deadlift nine times out of 10. Sometimes you do, but rarely. So those are the big things with uh, looking at gait, right? Uh, we go down our list and there's technically like 11 things. A couple of them are just information based. They're not necessarily gait based, like mileage, shoes, things like that. But it's just the general assessment of the runner. Um, if you're in that R2P uh, group, you will be receiving my notes here pretty soon from that. So look forward to that. If you're you know, a runner, a coach, a doc out there, uh, you can always hit me up, uh, email, social media, let me know if you have questions. Um, and then if you're in the Birmingham area, we do uh, gait analysis. I used to do them virtually, but I don't really like to anymore. I just think it's way better to get in the clinic because we have uh, some technology and obviously it's easier to do things live. So hope you got some out of that. Let me know if you have any questions. I'm going to go ahead and clear this off here. Uh, and as usual, I hope you learned something and uh, knowledge is only as powerful as the action inspires to so go do something about it.